Pathologic 2 is a survival horror fever dream that takes place in a world entirely its own. In this iteration, you play as the Horror Specs, a local who's come back from practicing battlefield medicine to attend to his father, the local healer. Before you can even get to your family home though, it turns out Pops was murdered and you're the number one suspect. By the way, a plague to end all plagues is starting to spread through the town and you might need to call on your medical experience to help out. Absolute terror ensues. I first saw this game when it was featured on one of the Halloween special episodes of Cinematech on G4 Tech TV. Out of all the zombie games featured that day, this one stuck with me as most of it was outright freaky and unexplainable. Yeah, cool, the T-Virus or whatever it is this time is back in Resident Evil whatever. Silent Hill is weird as usual in its own way we've grown accustomed to. But what the heck was that thing with the skinny dudes wearing masks? I tried looking up this episode to see if it gave any context to the game, but I can't find that episode anymore. This is less likely creepypasta starter material and more about how poorly archived Cinematech was compared to other G4 shows. There is a considerable amount of episodes on IMDb that simply aren't labeled or don't have full descriptions. Fast forward like a decade later and Mandalore's video about Pathologic pops into my subscription feed and all of my questions about that weird game I saw as a kid got answered. Pathologic 2? is less of a sequel and more of a from-the-ground-up remake of the first game. While the original game was pretty buggy if you tried to run it on a modern system, had a lot of translation issues as a team that made it hails from Moscow, and was generally rough around the edges, Pathologic 2 plays smoothly for the most part and all the things the characters are saying to me make sense. Uh, sort of. Everyone here speaks in riddles. I was originally meaning to play the first game with my wife who's fluent in Russian, but when I heard about this game and its remake coming, I held off. I ended up getting a key and immediately dived into this game. Fast forward a couple months of time to play the game and try to research everything I saw inside of it, and here we are. From the first day you get into town as a horror specs, there is a lot of things to do in town. The game is structured into acts as if it were a play, with some acts taking only one day, while others span the events of several days. As you learn of new things you can do, they're added to your journal as little drawings inside of circles. Interconnected events will have a line between them as you explore, and some events will butt off into smaller events or even branch off into multiple objectives. The result is a pretty impressive and at times very intimidating web of things and events in your journal, which give you a non-linear record of what's happened so far in the story. It's a little hard to get used to at first, but I like how it displays just how much is going on in this town and the interconnectedness of this world. Something that you're going to have to accept about all these things in your little web of tasks is that unless you're reading a guide or on your third or fourth playthrough, there will be things that you're either going to screw up or miss out on entirely simply because there's so much to do. There's only so much you can do as one person in this game, and you're going to have to stop chasing objectives to take care of your basic needs like food and rest every day unless you want to straight up die and be forced to take on some stat penalties in order to resume the game. You can't be everywhere at once, and at times, you're going to have to choose between if you want to save someone or if you want to go check something out on the other side of town that could provide an answer as to how to combat this plague. The things you choose to do during your limited time in town are going to affect how things can turn out. You have a host of people that you're bound to protect, and each of them are important to the story in one way or another. Sometimes you're going to have to choose between treating the sick in a certain district so that they'll tolerate you enough not to attack you on sight as you're passing through, or just try to make a break for it through that area because you have very limited medical supplies and one of your bound is in dire need of them. What you choose to barter or what you try to research will also come back to either haunt or help you later on in the game as some avenues of research are more fruitful than others. While you're trying to figure out if there even is a possible cure for whatever the heck is so nasty that even the buildings are getting sick, you'll notice just how outright alien the town and the people of the steppe are. The first area as you'll notice this is likely going to be in the names and the titles that everyone has. Let's start with the protagonist, who while in-game is known as Artemy Barak, the cub, he is known as the Haraspex to us, the player. I looked it up and a Haraspex is a kind of soothsayer from the times of the Roman Empire who would predict the future by disemboweling sacrificial animals and reading the markings on their organs, usually of goats, usually of their livers. Gnarly. This speaks a bit of truth to the Haraspex's role in the story, as he's what's called a menku, a person who is allowed to practice medicine on the steppe 
and who is eventually forced to commit a taboo by disemboweling victims of the plague in order to use their organs while trying to find out if there's a way to cure it. This doesn't exactly make him a popular person, as cutting a person by any means is taboo in this town, to the point that even trying to set a broken bone is frowned upon. There's a bunch of other interesting names, titles, and sayings present in this game, and I tried to write them all down and enlisted the help of my wife, who studied Russian linguistics at the University of St. Petersburg before coming to America, to try and decipher all of the things that we found in the game. Only one other word stuck out as meaning something intelligible to us. Shabnyak. This is a word that roughly translates to cobblestone in English, and by the context it's used in, it alludes to a demon-like entity with bony legs who is made out of clay instead of flesh. This is ever so vaguely reminiscent of the legend of Baba Yaga, but here is what one faction of people on the steppe, the kin, think is what's behind the plague. The kin are something almost entirely of their own creation in this game. They're sort of a tribalistic people who live on the steppe with the people of the town, and while they do intermingle with the locals in the city, they keep their traditions and ways of lives to themselves. With the Hara Specs being allowed to participate in some rites, as his father practiced their traditional medicine, as does Sahara Specs. I looked into real-world steppe cultures over the centuries, and I couldn't find anything that is a direct parallel to the kin. The kin revere bulls, but most steppe people, on the Eurasian steppe anyway, didn't care much for cattle, as what little grazable land they had was needed for horses. Most real-world steppe people are nomadic, but here the kin have committed to living outside the town and working in the massive factory called the Termitary. There is another word that means something else here, but it's used to describe a massive factory where the town's meat is prepared. This whole place is a trip. The best parallel I can think of to Pathologic 2 is the novel Dune, and how rather than a few inspirations, Dune had so many separate inspirations that it more into something entirely of its own. I admit there is a chance that there's some other source of inspiration that I simply couldn't find while doing my research, and I'm entirely open to the idea that this is off track. And then there's the way that everyone speaks to you. While the dialogue in this game isn't fully voice acted, all the characters will voice act cryptic adages to you when you start a conversation with them that could be a hint as to what this person is thinking or could just be some random thing that they're saying. Most of the time, there's something unexplained in conversation that you're not going to get the ELI 5 version of, or you'll be outright mocked if you ask for clarification with people, and they'll tell you that you've forgotten the ways of your home. The ability to figure out what's going on in this town is going to heavily rely on your ability to read into contextual clues in conversation, and deciphering the riddle speak everyone talks in. If you've ever gotten through a playthrough of VTMB as a Malkavian, though, I think you'll do fine. Pathologic 2 does spooky just as well as it does weird. This game knows how to start out just off-putting enough to keep the player interested and how to ramp it up to where you're freaking out by day 3 and you're in for a wild ride. This game starts out with an apocalyptic fever dream that may or may not have been an alternate future, followed by a tutorial spirit journey where you're riding on a train with a guy who sleeps in a coffin without being properly embraced. Poser. There are these guys everywhere who are explained in-world as part of a theater troupe whose director tires of traditional theater, so he's sending out his pantomime players into the city to express death in its fullest, and what is the freakiest display of guerrilla theater I have ever seen in a video game or in real life. These guys serve as helpers in the tutorial, spiritual reflections to the characters in-game, and general nightmare fuel. We've also got the peoples of the steppe, which might or might not be human, these non-Euclidean houses all over the place, and the fact that the children have broken off from the town's society into a state of nature from which their own government is being developed entirely separate from the rest of the town. Yeah, this is just normal, by the way. This is just setting you up for what happens next. Things will start really ramping up after the first couple days pass. Your first warning of this is that one of the kin, known as a bride, comes to you dressed in an extremely demonetizable fashion and instructs you to start feeding the earth blood whenever you hear its tummy rumble so that you can get some extra herbs. Later on, when you get the keys to your father's home, you can't help but notice that the building is covered in these nasty looking sores and everything feels like death. We aren't even to the part where the plague is actually setting in yet, too. Pathologic 2 makes a masterwork of pushing the envelope just when you thought things couldn't get any more freaky. I hope you like harvesting organs and getting attacked by plague mummies. Something that really sells the spooky nature of the plague is that while it is the main antagonist of the game, it has no physical form. 
the most it can do is manifest itself as a swarm of bugs or whatever the heck that stuff is that flies around. And in the event that you get infected by the plague, the plague itself will let you know that it's actually sentient by starting to talk to you through your own crippled immune system. We haven't even gotten into the Inquisitor yet or having to make your way through the infected parts of town, but I want to leave some surprises for you guys to discover yourself. If you've ever studied any sort of sociological discipline, the world building in Pathologic 2 is fascinating and hosts examples of a lot of concepts that we use to define why things happen in our world the way they do. But this is a video game video and not about me getting my undergrad in criminology, so I'll save this for another day. Something that you've probably discovered for yourself if you've started playing this game is that this game is harder than a brick wall and you're gonna have to throw yourself at it quite a few times. So far, I've had to roll back my save to several days prior, twice, and I'm still having a hard time despite knowing exactly what I need to do in certain situations from my own experience. Lucky for all of us who suck at video games, this game keeps every save that you ever make, so you can roll back to pretty much any point in your playthrough in the event that you get stuck or hit that wall. Most likely, it's going to be that you died once because you thought you were smart buying protective gear early in the game instead of, say, food, and you come back with a debuff that makes the game even harder. So you died again, and getting another debuff from that death, and so on and so forth, until that guy from the train offers you a deal and you know that you've done screwed up this time. Let's roll back that save and see where we went wrong. This game is aware of what you're doing too. It will give you a cautionary loading screen tip in the event that it catches you loading a save after things went poorly for you, but sometimes it just feels like the game is mocking you. The toughest enemy in this game by far are all the personal needs you need to fulfill pitted against the extreme scarcity as the plague gets underway. Even before people started getting really sick, the trains that kept the town supplied suddenly stopped coming. The town needs these trains for supplies as, aside from beef, which no one really is able to produce anymore because everyone got sick, the majority of foodstuffs and life staples come from the outside world. The trains have stopped coming, save for the one that the Horrorspecs came in on for like a week or so now, and the famine has already started to set in. Food goes from relatively cheap on day one to prohibitively expensive by days three and four, to outright unavailable in the later days unless you want to raid the pantries of those who died in the infected regions. That's a big risk though. Often satisfying one need will end up putting another in dangerously low conditions. You're so exhausted that you have to sleep or else you'll start taking a constant health penalty, but in order to get enough sleep, you'll have to sleep for so long that you become dangerously hungry and again in danger of another constant health penalty. However, once you finally get some food to eat, it turns out the food is so salty that now you're thirst is in the danger zone and getting to a safe place to drink where you can put yourself in a spot where your immunity gets dangerously low because you had to go find a water barrel in a plague area or you became hungry again because you had to take the long way across town avoiding the infected zones to get to your lair in order to obtain safe drinking water that isn't in an area that poses an immediate threat to your health and safety. You're going to be constantly juggling your needs on top of trying to fight a sentient plague and that plague is a tough one. Even with full protective clothing, you can get pretty sick pretty fast unless you're constantly popping immunity boosters and once you're sick, you are screwed, my friend. You're going to have to go into infected zones quite a bit in order to try and save your bound characters and as the days go by, there grows to be more sick parts of the town than there are healthy ones. By the way, if you're like me, you're going to find out the hard way as you're desperately running through an infected zone trying to get to the ferry to get the hell out of sick land before you keel over that the ferryman's gonna stop you and be all like, nope, we're only in the business of sailing you into infected territory, not out. Have fun dying, bud. This plague owns you, and you're not in any position to be pushing boundaries while you're trying to fight this thing off. Full disclosure time. This game is so hard that I haven't been able to properly beat it on my own yet. This is also possibly because at the moment I have spent more time doing research into all the things I saw early in the game, like all those crazy phrases and possible inspirations for the kin and stuff like that. And just like some research attempts I've done in Pathologic 2, most of those have turned out to be utterly fruitless. I've decided to eat my humble pie though and turn off the intended difficulty setting so I can finish this game in a much more forgiving 
interesting state. I'm certainly glad that Icepick Lodge put this in the game, but I can see why they did it so reluctantly. A lot of the story in this game comes from just how hard it is to survive and the choices that you're going to be forced to make in order to survive long enough to see things through. I have to credit them though. This is one of the most fine-tunable difficulty settings that I've played through. It's reminiscent of the 2013 Thief reboot or making a custom world in Don't Star. I've seen a lot of hack journalists already make the comparison to Dark Souls, and I have to entirely disagree. This game is not like Dark Souls hard, but it's an entirely different kind of hard. Dark Souls is a kind of challenge where enemies are tough, but predictable, and as long as you follow the rules, you're going to be fine. Most of your deaths will come from getting too cocky or not paying attention to something that you knew better than to get lazy about. Pathologic 2 is a kind of hard where certain things you just cannot win against. Certain things you bet the farm on turn out to be entirely useless. Certain people that you accidentally upset turn out to be people that you absolutely need later on. And your greatest enemy isn't any particular monster or thug or whatever, but it's your own basic human needs in the face of this play. There's also no safe little fireplace to collect yourself for a moment in the middle of the chaos. Eventually, nowhere is going to be safe in this town if things go badly. If you're familiar with the original game, you're aware that there were three different characters you could play as, each with their own view of the story. Well, Pathologic 2 is going to be an episodic experience, with Episode 1 being the horror aspects of the story, which is what we've covered today. At the time of recording this, there's no clear date as to when the Bachelor or the Changeling stories are going to be published, but from what we have so far, a single playthrough of one character's story in Pathologic 2 can take anywhere between 20 to over 30 hours. Suffice it to say, we're in for a lot more Pathologic 2 in the future. These other two characters will likely tell stories that are completely different from the Horaspexes. The Bachelor is considered a complete outsider from the society of the town and the kin, but he's a more trustworthy sort to the outside government, and he has a formal education in medicine as opposed to the Horaspexes' traditional healing methods and battlefield medicine. The Changeling will have an entirely different insight compared to the other two, as she's still a child and thus is allowed to take part in the new society that the town's children are forming, and is seen to be something of a power player inside of it from the perspective of the Horaspex. As you might have recalled if you played the original game or watched Mandalore Gaming's video like the rest of us did, you need to play all three stories in order to get to the bottom of what's happening in the town. With the time that Ice Pick Lodge is taking to make these other two stories, I'm sure it's gonna be a good time. Well, sort of. It's as good as a time as dying of hunger while a plague ravages your hometown can be. This is gonna be it for today and for this lovely experiment I'm calling Halloween in July. I really hope you enjoyed it and that you got a kick of seeing Pathologic 2, and you might like this game if you're into brutal challenges, the spooky, and the surreal. If you do want to give this game a try, I've included an affiliate link to the Humble store where you can purchase the game through Humble, which will allow you to not only activate it on whatever platform you'd like, but will also support this channel and charitable costs. Be warned though, this game is not for the faint of heart or the easily frustrated. I'd like to thank all my patrons who support this channel through Patreon, and if you'd like sneak peek at the videos or want to know what's going on in the long run for this channel, feel free to check out patreon.com slash charlatan where the minimum pledge will get you full access. Also, I know some of you have been really hankering for another cooking video, and trust me, one is coming soon in one of the upcoming videos. So until next time, Sign-offs are stupid, and I have no idea how to do them, so enjoy this cat video. You know, it's been pretty hot today, and I've been running the AC quite a bit, and I don't think I should be using that much power. And I've got this perfectly good ceiling fan right here, but I have one issue. Frisk and the ceiling fan are mortal enemies. Alright, let's, uh, let's just see what happens. He seems to be getting more acclimated to it, but, uh... I don't know. Here goes nothing. It's okay, baby. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt you. It's just going to make things nice and cool for us, and it's going to save us money on the power bill. And I'll slow it down a bit, because that, that's going fast. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I've, I've ruined your nap. I'm sorry, sassy boy. You want to play with the toy? All right, we'll get some playtime in and you'll feel better in no time.